Now, moving on, and the NHS has finally caved to pressure from Talk TV to suspend terror doctor Wahid Shaida after it was revealed that the GP is the UK leader of the now-banned terror group Hizbut Tahir. In a statement, NHS London said, We take any issues relating to professional conduct seriously and have procedures in place to make sure that individuals are fit to work in the NHS. We can confirm that Dr. Wahid Shaida has been suspended from the NHS primary care performers list. Uh, back in December, Talk TV's Piers Morgan challenged Dr. Shaida to condemn members of his own group chanting for jihad on the streets of London. Do you support the chanting of jihad? The chanting of jihad by somebody there, unscripted... Well, quite a few people there. Uh, actually, actually, no, it was about two people. So you would, you would condemn that? Of course I wouldn't condemn that. You wouldn't? No, because jihad in that context mm. is to... They, as they understood it and they were chanting, is for the official armies of Muslim countries to enter and intervene. Rubbish. He was also caught on camera praising the October the 7th Hamas attacks. Mujahideen, they gave the enemy a punch on the nose. Mm. All right? And, and it's a very welcome punch on the nose. Well, joining us now is founder and executive director of National Security Think Tank, the Henry Jackson Society, Dr Alan Mendoza. Hi, Alan. Um, first of all, Hello. can you explain to us a little bit about who Hizbut Tahir are, uh, why we took so long to prescribe them when other countries had done that for a long time? Well, yes. Um, so Hizbut Tahrir is a long-standing Islamist group, now, of course, deemed a terrorist organisation uh, in the UK, as indeed in many other countries uh, in Europe and uh, further afield. Um, and, of course, as with any uh, Islamist um, organisation of this nature, it seeks to impose, if you like, a Sharia law state uh, on the country and to sort of, you know, bring us into line with uh, Sharia law dictums. Now, it's taken a long time to get to get to this point because for years, uh, starting with the Blair government, by the way, it's been a long, long burn, and then the Cameron government and beyond, people were umming and ahhing over whether what they were saying was actually sufficiently extremist to be terrorist, as it were, or just extreme. And of course, we know there's a careful line, but I think what's tipped the balance, finally, ironically, is the uh, support by his, his book, Tahrir, for the Hamas terrorist atrocities in, uh, in uh, Israel, of course, on October the 7th. And that has led Finally, the government to take the action it probably should have taken years ago uh, to actually declare this organisation a terrorist entity. And, and of course, uh, that's why uh, Dr Shaida is now suspended as a GP. He, until yesterday, was practising in Hounslow, uh, to the west of London, near Heathrow Airport. Uh, the question now is, since he's the leader of a prescribed terrorist organisation, that's against the law. He, he needs to be more than suspended as a GP. He needs to have his collar felt, be arrested pretty damn quick, doesn't he? Well, yes, it would seem to me that that is uh, the next step here. If you are the, the leader of an organisation that's been declared terrorist entity, then action needs to be taken against you and anyone else, for that matter, who declares themselves to be part of it, unless you, you know, kind of undergo a, some kind of miraculous conversion where you're now uh, critiquing what it stood for and everything else. But as you saw in that clip in December, um, he, you know, there were lines that he wouldn't cross when Piers Morgan was uh, was interviewing him. I watched that interview, and it was quite obvious that the, that despite Piers giving him plenty of opportunity to uh, to sort of row back on some of the things that were going on, he had no intention of doing so. Now, whether he whether he's changed his mind on that, who knows? But clearly, now the organisation is a terrorist uh, entity. At the very least, he should be uh, hauled in for questioning to work out where he sits on this. How big are they as an organisation? And do we have any idea of what sort of backing they've got, who might be funding them and if they have overseas connections? Well, obviously, um, as, as you've seen, multiple countries have banned them, which tells you that Hezbo Tahrir is a global movement. Um, as with many Islamist organisations, and you can look at uh, other groups uh, which aren't necessarily banned here, like the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, but which are banned in other countries, you can see they've got outposts in different places. Um, you know, the actual strength of these organisations is kind of difficult to monitor. I mean, for a long time, interestingly, Hezbollah Tahrir here was, you know, considered to be, um, you know, on the on, on the outs, as it were, in terms of its numbers. But I think post-October the 7th, an interesting thing happened. You saw frequent uh, sort of... Um, uh, you know, kind of marches and the sense that they were mu they were on the, if you like, on the lookout for recruits. And I think it was that newfound confidence and convinced people that here's a threat again. But it's a global movement. It's getting funding both domestically and internationally. And as always, you need to follow the money to understand where groups like this are actually funded from to understand how to also stop them. 
Uh, Alan, you're a well-connected man. I don't suppose you've heard on the grapevine uh, what the mighty BBC is uh, fixing to decide what to do about this prescribed organisation. Of course, they refuse to call Hamas terrorists. Do we think uh, they will concede that Hizbut Tahrir are terrorists? Well, I think they might, because the difference is, that if you look at how the BBC referred to, say, ISIS, they were quite happy to use the terrorist designation there. I mean, I think um, if it is a a group that is acting, you know, that is um, acting heavily domestically, they appear to have a different criteria to what's deemed abroad. So I think, um, although we'll have to wait to see if they actually cover this, we'll have to see what they say. But I do think there are clear differences and the ISIS model will be one I'm sure they'll be following for this. Uh, and finally, Alan, it wasn't that long ago that we had the huge rise of ISIS in Syria and Iraq and a sort of sense, a palpable threat on the streets in the UK where we were braced constantly for terror attacks here in our own country. So lots of people going to join ISIS, uh, um, schoolgirls, a lot of them. Um, have things changed for the better or are we still on the brink of any some sort of terror threat in this country? Oh, well, they haven't changed the better in the sense that we still are just always one step away from this sort of attack happening. Just remember that the, the watch list, the, uh, the official intelligence services watch list of the most dangerous people in this country, which comprises around 43,000 individuals, um, about 90% of those uh, are from a um, radical Muslim um, background. Mm -hmm. So even if ISIS itself has disappeared, and Al-Qaeda before it, and others, there are still people out there who adhere to similar ideologies, of which Hizbut Tahrir is now uh, been put firmly in, in, in that place as well, who might well be considering terrorist actions. And there, but for the grace of God, our security services constantly have to intervene, as we know, to stop those plots before they get to the actionable stage. So far, we've been uh, lucky and, and they, you know, we, they prevented it from happening. But there's no doubt that there's a possibility of such an attack occurring at any given moment. You just mentioned, Alan, Alan last uh, question, you just mentioned there are as many as 43,000 oh, dangerous individuals roaming the streets of this country. Add that to the fact that every weekend in all the major cities, particularly in London, these long snaking pro-Palestinian marches amid which our people chanting jihad and from the river to the sea, supporting terrorist groups. I mean, the whole picture is one of the... that we have dropped the ball on this. We are not strict enough on this and it is endangering this country. The government and the police have got to do something. They've got to stop all of this illegal activity every weekend for a start. Well, yeah, clearly um, we, we've seen deficiencies in how the police approach these things, how politicians have... Uh, you know, said one thing, but then not enacted it. And um, you just have to look at what other countries are doing to see that we're out of kilter now. The Germans have banned the phrase from the river to the sea. They say, if you say it, it's a clear incitement to genocide and murder. We're not allowing it on our streets. And the German police will arrest you if you say it. In France, they ban the protests altogether. It's quite clear that we are, you know, the weak man of Europe, uh, rather ironically, on this approach and for whatever reason we are not taking seriously the security implications of allowing some of this language and activity to be occurring on our streets no one's saying you know stop protesting but it's quite clear that if you protest in a certain way and you're uh, calling for jihad or if you're calling for from the river to the sea and we all know what it means it isn't some you know kind of spiritual activity we know what it means then that needs to be actioned and we need to stop this nonsense on our streets week in week out because if you don't all you're doing is encouraging further aggression down the line as people say, well, what next can I say or do? And I'll see if they stop me. Yeah, Dr Alan Mandoza, thank you so much for your time. Great to talk to you.